Good morning. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. This m <laughs> this morning, actually, I'm Chamberlain Uso. Indeed, it's a Wednesday morning. Good morning and welcome. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. It's good to be here. Good morning and welcome. I am Bukola Koka. And I'm Aya Makina. Good morning and welcome to the 23rd day in the month of August, 2023. Um, if this were radio, I'd give you a time check, but it's not. But one thing that I can give you a check of is the need for us to focus on what's important. You know, often we talk about the vastness of Nigeria and how far, few and far between the people are sometimes. You know, talking about rail infrastructure, uh, it's not once or twice that we have talked about the need to pay attention to the things that are important as far as that is concerned. Uh, it was reported yesterday that the NSCDC arrested uh, a number of people uh, about who were vandalizing uh, road, rail infrastructure. And, you know, it's really very, very shocking to find out that such a thing will still exist, you know, in our climb here, especially uh, looking at a time when uh, these things are new. And not a few of us have uh, shouted about the need for us to focus on these things that are important to us and jointly protect our national infrastructure. Look at it, for instance, seven, 13 people are said to have been arrested, uh, suspected railway vandals, they call them, and facilities worth 800 million naira was impounded from these folks. Uh, these suspects were paraded alongside five trucks, uh, said to have parade, been paraded along, alongside five trucks conveying large quantities of vandalized rails and the sleepers at the NSCDC headquarters in Abuja. You know, the, the, it raises a question in me about, first, for instance, what was supposed to be the function of the NSCDC in the first place. And this is just one of them. They are supposed to work with the police in, mm -hmm. in ensuring that some of these things that are done uh, are being done. You know, but you know, the natural, one of the questions that it raises with me, Bukola, whenever we talk about such issues, especially as concerns Nigeria is, who is talking about patriotism? I, I just knew that you were going to go there, Ayo. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't help it because if these people knew that vandalizing infrastructure is not vandalizing government property, but vandalizing your own property, knowing that these things are going to have telling impact on the lives, not just of yourself, but of other people as well. You know, there's that African proverb that when you throw a, a, a stone into the market, it'll, it could hit someone who is a, a relative of yours. So just imagine one of your relatives, someone you love so dearly, for whom you are trying to raise this money, is in any of those trains, for instance. What happens? That yeah. person dies. And so many lives are connected to these. I mean, for decades we've been talking about the need to diversify a number of things, including our transportation. Uh, the uh, situation where uh, cattle is moved from up north down to the south by road has a telling impact on the, ro on the roads. Uh, we will move uh, petroleum products through the roads as opposed, in some cases, uh, or as opposed to using uh, the rails, these things have telling impact. But mm -hmm. to vandalize them, I don't even know. So I'm asking that question again, Bukola. Who is preaching the duties of the Nigerian citizen and who is talking about patriotism to the Nigerian? It's a question I'm still looking for answers to. Uh, you, know, you, you already have your answers. And, you know, this reminds me of our conversation with the former director general of the National Orientation Agency, you know, just about sometime early last week when he was saying that this should be somewhat or somehow incorporated into our, um, you know, curriculum for schools. But these things are found there one way or the other, particularly if you're a parent and you go through your child's books, loyalty to the nation, patriotism, honesty, they're found there one way or the other. But like Ayo has said, I'd like to always ask about our whys. 
Why do we do the things that we do? You know, at the height of the insurgency in Nigeria, what was common, you know, amongst the analysts was that, you know, an assault on one is an assault on all. We cannot all sit pretty when something, you know, um, of such a magnitude is happening in one part of the country and think that it's not going to somehow trickle further down. It's the same thing with what people do when they vandalize infrastructure that is supposed to be our commonwealth. Um, you know, weeks ago, um, someone was caught, or was it a CCTV camera, uh, showing someone who was vandalizing perhaps the pliers on the second Niger Bridge. If government had not built this infrastructure, you know, Nigerian citizens would be quick to criticize government for neglect. But this infrastructure has been put in place for our collective benefit, for our commonwealth. You know, when trains derail, when accidents happen along uh, the rail tracks, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's tragedies, it, it results in tragedies of monumental proportion. Now, when citizens do this, you know, they're creating the, 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 the leeway for these things to happen, you know, danger for their own fellow citizens. I, I wonder why what the whys of this citizen is. Is it quick um, um, wealth? Because it, it, it amounts to nothing really at the end of the day. Um, so uh, we, should, we should review, um, you know, um, what we do as well at home, what our parents do as well on the home front. Um, if education has covered it, then our parents do it as home. The family unit, you know, should also take responsibility for grooming of the individual and also the community as well. You know, in, in the past, they used to say that, you know, it's not just the parents you know, that is responsible for the grooming of the individual. It is the collective responsibility of the community. So individuals must take a second thought about, you know, why they do these things as well. Two days ago, was it uh, two days ago as well, you know, the Nigerian uh, Navy caught some individuals that were going to breach um, the boring vessel, you know, where um, um, NS, NNPC officials, NNPC vessels, where they pick up um, their products from. And if that had happened, it would have been a major you know, damage to infrastructure. That, the, that pipeline was huge you know, on the sea. Uh, it was a good thing that that was stopped. And as well, you know, Nigerians who do this just must have a rethink and stop what they do. Malpe. Uh, Bukala, I, I, I agree with you on all the points that you have raised, that indeed, you know, the problems that we've raised are much deeper than just, it speaks to a, a number of issues, uh, which I think we have emphasized over and over again on this program, from the issue of values to, I mean, as Ayo also highlighted, patriotism. But then I think we also have, uh, as our government also has some responsibility here for many years. I mean, if you also look at a type and this is not to justify the action of the, uh, of the vandals. It certainly can never be an excuse in that direction. But if we have learned to waste things over the years, if we haven't taken responsibility and have let things, um, you know, lay low and people have found these things useful to them and, you know, we have done nothing about it, don't we also bear some responsibility here? Um, it's only now that the Nigeria Railway Corporation is beginning to receive new life with the railway, uh, railway lines that have, uh, you know, been uh, started and also the services that have now started along some of the lines. I mean, some new lines have been built and, of course, new trains brought in. Lagos, Ibadan is one of them, Kaduna, Abuja. We've also seen uh, some attempts at uh, vandalism even on, on those ones as well. Um, but we also have the Wari Itakwe route, and we've also seen, uh, you know, some security breaches there as well. Uh, but for many years, I mean, <laughs> the railway lines are not exactly new. For many years, these slippers and lines were there. Um, for many years, you and I, I do not know what it was like for you, Bukala, but I did not see many trains while I was growing up. It's only now that I am now a grown adult that I've had the privilege to be able to enter a train, yet these lines were there. You had, I used to wonder when we passed, I mean, some of these uh, rail lines, when we crossed them, I'll be like, oh, you mean once we had trains? Um, yeah, they were just there, <laughs> wasting away as it were. So maybe these people have decided that, you know, they, they could have been used for it. This, as I said, is not any 
uh, reason to justify the actions of these people. But these lines were left to waste, literally to rot, uh, for many years, until now when we're beginning to breathe new life into them. And the actions that they have now started is now affecting even the things the new things that we're building. So I think that, you know, whilst it is that, you know, we, we bring down a heavy hammer on the people who vandalize properties meant for everybody. I think in Borno State, for instance, you've seen the governor there, uh, you know, bring down a heavy hammer on uh, the so-called babambola, the people who uh, look for recycled scrap metal, you know, for recycling and in the process are vandalizing things like streetlights in, 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 in the name of looking for scrap metal or in the, trying to scrap it, as a matter of fact. Um, while we, we bring down a heavy hammer on people like that, I think our government also needs to talk to itself in terms of what infrastructure do we have lying fallow, being left to waste and rot away. And maybe people can point to so many. People talk about the federal secretariat in Lagos, uh, which was there for many years, uh, it's still there. People, no one seems to be, you know, caring about it. Uh, what about all the other government infrastructure which were once viable and which somehow we've left fallow for many years? Is it until people go there to vandalize it and, you know, try to take what is valuable from it before we begin to realize that these things are of value and even when they're not in use, we should find ways to put them to productive use? Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, while there, there are a number of issues... Uh, to look at. I also think that government needs to look at the area of waste, how it is that it is encouraging waste and how you shouldn't just wake up only when people now begin to see that, you know, oh, these things can, and can offer some value to them. Maybe uh, when we also do some, you know, uh, talking to or to our own government, then perhaps, you know, we'll also have sufficient, uh, will I say verb now, uh, to talk to those, uh, we've spoken about this so many times, so, to talk to those, to talk to all of us, as a matter of fact, about patriotism, about needing to keep our assets well, about needing to protect the things that are meant for everybody. But until then, uh, Chimbaling, I'm afraid that, you know, these are the kinds of behaviors that government itself will be unwillingly, uh, you, you know, tolerated by its own actions. You know, guys, this is a very serious matter we've got on our hands here because, I mean, Previously, you, you, you think, okay, well, you see the reports once in a while. It's a one-off. Happens here, happens there. And probably you think that that's what that is about, petty crime. But look, if you just, just do a little bit of research, you find out, oh, wait a minute, this is nationwide. The report you highlighted in Lagos, guys, it's nationwide. NSCDC says this is an organized syndicate. They carry out this across the country. Now... As far back as 2021, the police in Nasarawa State said that um, uh, they arrested a Chinese national who happens to be the managing director of a certain Yongjing Steel Company here in the FCT and a special advisor to the governor of Nasarawa State on infrastructure hmm. on this same matter. Now, they said that uh, this syndicate had been involved in buying and selling these things, and that wasn't just where it ended. They also arrested two police officers and a personnel of NSCDC, yeah, a former supervisory councillor in the state as well. I say all of them had been involved in this syndicate. They buy and sell this infrastructure. Now, remember that we get loan from the Chinese to build this infrastructure. So if they, their nationals, have been caught involved in buying and selling and vandalizing that property, we're going to sit back and ask ourselves questions here. What exactly is going on? Are they trying to vandalize this or the what? Sabotage our efforts. We're stuck in this loan. We keep going on. So sometimes you need to look at the door, look at the world, not from a keyhole, but a broader perspective in terms of what is actually going on. Now, the SHA, the governor on infrastructure at the time, did say, look, he's a businessman. He didn't know that what he got was stolen goods. It was the first time they were delivering to him, and the person who sold to him had died in an accident along Nasara Road uh, and all of those. But there's also a twist to this. Now, uh, much as the police said they arrested it through their uh, anti-vandalism template, but there was a certain lawyer, 
based in Benin City, who is an advisor to the managing director of that Chinese company, Yongjing, who tried to, guess what, bribe the police with 600,000 naira to let the client go. So this is deeper than we all thought that it is. So it's huge. The police need to look into all of these things properly because it does appear as though almost people in different areas are involved in this. And that's why you see things like pipeline vandalism, things like all of this. They, they involve certain key persons in certain areas, and that's why they are emboldened because they feel that, after all, they're involved. If anybody were to catch us, they've got our backs because that's what they'll tell them. So, I mean, when I also did cover uh, the vandalism in Mossimi, it was an industry. At night, you get there, you see properly fabricated items. You know that, wow, you got some intelligent chaps who are deploying the intelligence negatively. But it is huge. And I think that it's something that uh, we all should pay a lot more attention because if they are deliberately vandalizing mm -hmm. all of these things, then you know that some persons don't intend to give up on this kind of things. And if that's their perspective, why should we just let it lie low? So something that we need to pay a lot more attention to. And this was in 2021. And then the one they caught today, what? $800 million Naira worth? Wow. Just wow. All right, let's take a look at the dailies now. We'll start with New Telegraph this morning. On pass. Yeah. AU suspends Niger as ECOWAS and VOI assures of diplomatic resolution. Reject West African bloc's planned war. Group tells unions workers. So I hope that the group too will be telling this junta to do the right things as well, such that um, you're seen to be at least making appealing to all sides of the divide, else they may just take what your suggestions with a pinch of salt, you never know really. Yeah, that, this is the lead story of New Telegraph today. Mm -hmm. And then you see uh, above that lead story, export ban. Nigeria loses out in 2.35 trillion Naira African rice market. Wait a minute, we lose uh, an international scene in terms of, you know, West Coast. And now we also lose in the African rice market, no, we can't keep losing across board. We just had to do something about all of these things. Then at the bottom strip here, batch C, 274 firms jostle for NYC contract. contracts, in plural. Uh, we don't want court members to look like mad people in uniform, DG. <laughs> so you see... 274 <laughs> firms are jostling for NYC <laughs> contracts. So, I mean, you just busy journalists, you just focus on the reports, do all of this, and you're like, ah, you mean they have this kind of contract that 274 firms are jostling for? What is in this contract? Anyways? They can leave their jobs and go and become contractors if they want <laughs> <laughs> and jostle so if they're oh, not boy. content to report. <laughs> <laughs> Well, take a look at what Daily Trust has on the front page here. Um, they have this. Tenobu's 48 ministers to gulp 8.6 billion naira in four years. Um, you might want some un context to the story. Uh, more to be spent on Esther Codes, others. Earnings to shoot after Ramfax wages review. Uh, it's wasteful. Implement Oran Saye report now. That's according to experts. National Assembly should trim cabinet to 20. Uh, the story is on page four of the paper. You also have a uh, breakdown there, salaries and allowances per annum, the salary of each minister per annum, allowances of each minister per annum. Um, and you also see the amount budgeted for recurrent expenditure in 2023. They also show you a graph of um, how many ministers We've seen over the years nomination and confirmation of ministers. So you find there 48 and 45 confirmed. Uh, you also have at the bottom here insecurity, defense minister demands timeline from service chiefs. OK, 
okay? Is this something that's going to be sustained? Because it looks like everybody's talking tough and, you know, trying to hit the ground running, as we say. Um, but page five is where you get details now. Timelines for implementation of their plans, perhaps. Page five will give you details. Don't question me. <laughs> Daily <laughs> Trust is what I'm reviewing. And look at this. AU suspends Niger as ECOWAS delegation assures of diplomacy. So page eight read. UK reduces tariff on 3,000 Nigerian products. Just in case you're curious, in case you want to go into the export business and you're looking at the United Kingdom as a destination of choice, stage 23 will give you details. And look at this, pilot of crashed NAF jet buried in Zaria. The story is on page 11 um, of the paper. We'll leave it there for Daily Trust. And up next is the Nigerian Tribune with um, a headline that is, you know, on the lips of many and is just as concerning. AU suspends Niger over coup. Abdul Salami says crisis may be resolved through diplomacy. A people of Niger, northern Nigeria, one and same. Let's avoid civil war, El Fai tells Echoers. And, um, you know, indeed. That was instructive when he came in yesterday. Um, when you go to war with your cousins, you might as well be going to war with your siblings. So everything uh, to avoid the war must be explored. Uh, it's a page eight read in case you're looking for um, many more details as to that report. Um, under the nameplates, you find uh, quite a number of interesting stories. The, New ministers have indeed resumed duty and a lot of them uh, stating, you know, their commitment to service delivery. Listen to this one. Seek redeployment if you can't deliver. Wiki warns FCT directors. There's certainly a new sheriff in town. Um, I find that interesting <laughs> because on the front page of uh, the news direct that, uh, well, beg your pardon, uh, new daily trust, I'm not aware of I saw just the headline, I haven't read the story, um, former governor of, um, well, the, the now minister of, uh, in, in the cabinet, uh, former governor Omahi, was saying to civil servants, you can't frustrate me. <laughs> <laughs> Here we have this one now, so you look, if you are not satisfied, move on. I think I, I, it, it will be interesting really to, to listen to how, to see how the new ministers will take on this responsibility because performance, as far as I'm concerned, is about um, people, mm -hmm. people management. Mm -hmm. Because you're not the one that is going to carry the banners and all for yourself. It's going to be the people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at a few more. Tinubu to create 10 million jobs through Humanitarian Affairs Ministry. That's described to the new minister, Beta Idu. Umahi orders work stoppage on Gadabu Bridge. Uh, well, as we say, take a closer look at the uh, story before you reach your conclusion about the headlines. So let's leave it there for the Nigerian Tribune. Nigerian News Direct has uh, this on its front page. Dialogue stalls as more sanctions hit Niger. Uh, African Union suspends Niger, directs states to implement sanctions imposed by ECOWAS. L5 Fanikade cautioned ECOWAS against military intervention. ECOWAS envoy submits report. The story you find details off on page four of the paper today. Uh, right above the nameplate, Nimsi DG bows out as Tinubu approves engineer Odushote as replacement. Um, look, we got to get Nimsi right. And whoever can do it, please let the person come in and, and get the job done. Incidentally, the, this new DG was essay to um, the president when he was governor in Lagos, in Lagos. essay in technology. So I guess we we'll wait to see how this. I, 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 that's out. instructive. We don't just need to get um, you know NIMSI right. We need to get our data harmonization right. Whether Thank it's you. the electoral register, whether it's a NIMSI, or whether it's the population, we I was, just I was must trying, get it right I was trying not to and get use that there. information for planning and to check crime. I was trying not to go there, but now that you've gone there, approved. Uh, at the, <laughs> at the bo bottom of the page. Naira falls to 900 to the dollar. And um, right beside that one, FG states LG's share 966 billion Naira July revenue. I don't understand. I thought we said we, we was up to one point something trillion uh, previously. But hey, that's what you have on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct this morning.
Guardian, FG ignores 17-year-old concession fee debts, renews terminal leases. That's a big focus on the front page here this morning. Uh, I'll also take just one more. How rising unemployment, others worsen school dropout rate. I mean, guys, we were just talking about the challenge of vandalism of public infrastructure, you know, with which we spend billions, if not trillions, to install. And the other part that uh, I didn't mention is that when that uh, advisor on the, to the Nassar State governor on infrastructure said, it's his first time, and, you know, when he sold all of those sleepers and equipment, guess how much he sold it for? 3.6 million naira. There's obviously a big market for it. So if somebody who has nothing mm -hmm. just gets into it, buys it and sells for what, 3.6 million? You think they'll easily leave it? I have to really think what we need to do, how we need to. But they would, some people will just die doing it. That's a guardian this morning. Uh, you also see here, Vanguard has this. They're talking diplomacy this morning. Niger, AU plans sanctions against Janta's supporters. The story's on page five for you. Once impact assessment of ECOWAS force rejects interference by non-African states, suspends Niger over coup. Abdusalami delivers military Janta's terms to ECOWAS, says diplomacy will see the better of situation notes that meeting with Niger Junta fruitful, suspected jihadists killed 12 Niger troops, says State TV. Power cuts in Niger threaten to spoil millions of vaccines as sanctions bite, as according to the United Nations. Military intervention in Niger's war between brothers, El Rufai wants echoes. So the story is on page five. Um, of the paper. They also have their uh, former military head of state, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, briefing the press uh, after briefing the president yesterday. Uh, you also see this, Tinubu sends Nimsi boss on terminal leave. That story is there. And uh, that's what we've highlighted earlier. Railway vandalism in SCDC, arrest 13, impounds railings, sleepers worth 8.8 billion naira. So billion. that's it. Point eight. Point eight. Zero point oh, eight. That's eight hundred million. <laughs> that's oh. eight hundred million there is. Oh, I see what to, that headline did. To give it more I effect, see it. to say point eight billion, which is close to a billion. I mean, if you did simple maths, any figure from five point five, you can approximate it to the next the point eight. It's How close to a billion. That's things? almost a billion naira worth of slippers. Uh, we really need to do better by ourselves. Look on top of the nameplate there. Gas flare in Nigeria loses 34.1 billion naira as oil firms flare 12.7 MSCF. I don't know what the abbreviation is that. I know that's the cubic feet is the last one. What is MS? Okay. Page 19, just in case you're curious like me and you don't know the measurements of gas. <laughs> You'll find it on page 19 of the paper. Um, and look at this. UK police charges ex-Petroleum Minister Alice Madwiki with bribery. So it does appear that the United Kingdom is doing for us what we've neglected to do, or are they acting on our authority? Page 9 is where you find details. And 34 years after, Obaseki settles late Ambrose and Lee's benefits, releases 1.3 billion naira for Monax. There is on page 4 all the paper. There was, I think it was another state who sent all their monarchs on a compulsory, what was that now? Medical checks. All of them had to go on medical checks. Well, we'll leave it there for Vanguard newspapers this morning. <laughs> What's and going on? Compulsory medical checks? <laughs> <laughs> And very quickly take a look at Daily Independent, where we'll, we've already reviewed for you the big story on some of the other papers, which is the same for Daily Independent. That's uh, the efforts to check, um, you know, any form of uh, war or, or, or aggression to settle the Niger matter. But there are some other stories, you know, under the big story. PDP knocks Tinubu over bloated cabinet endurance main track that's a page seven read of course we saw uh, one of the governorship uh, uh 
aspirant or candidate, if you like, from Ogun State speaking yesterday. Um, there's also this one, FG considers electric vehicles for mass transit scheme. When will they come? Nigerians are waiting. It's a page seven read, just in case you're as concerned and you're anticipating that as well. Then there's this one um, that's interesting, above the nameplate, Ondo, Akiridolu's planned return sets acting governor in panic mode. You know, I thought that, you know, anyone anticipating his return would be rejoicing. Uh, we're praying for a speedy recovery of the governor. But, you know, I'm just wondering. It's a page, um, I believe, page six read, um, just in case you're interested in the politics of Ondo State. Let's leave it there for Daily Independent. And that's the much of uh, the papers we can take this morning. We're right back uh, after this break to begin the conversation. So please grab your cup of coffee. We'll be right here. Four hours after taking their oath of office, more ministers are reporting to their designated officers. Upon assumption of office, the ministers speak on their mandate as members of the Federal Executive Council. We'll even find mechanisms of lowering the cost of mon monitoring and evaluation. Technology can be used. We will involve stakeholders. If a road project is taking place in a location, there are many ways you can involve those people located in those places to participate in monitoring and evaluation. My modus operandi is results. Uh, I really don't care how you get me the results as long as you use legitimate things to get the results. Former Yobe State Governor assumes office at the Ministry of Police Affairs. He also met with the staff of the ministry and charged them to embrace innovations to drive police ecosystems. I encourage each one of you to embrace innovation, to think creatively, and to propose ideas that will enable us to adapt and evolve in this ever-changing landscape. Staying with security, two former governors are assuming office at the Ministry of Defense. Former Governor of Jigawa State, Mr. Muhammad Abubakar, promises remarkable changes in the security situation of the country. We have to deliver for our people. We have to deliver for the country. And have the promise today with all of you that within a year or so, we will have remarkable change in the security architecture of this country. The tasks before the ministers are also acknowledged when the Minister of Education and his counterpart in the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Technology assumed office in their separate ministries. I will offer strong guidance, strong guidance on the following key principles. Strong collaboration between the ministry and the agencies is vital. Let's unite and work together for shared objectives through effective communication. We are going to focus on what will bring change, fundamental change to the society, uh, so that by the next one year, people can see that we have policies on ground that is meant to uh, disrupt somehow some of the things have not that have not been uh, either not done well or need rejiggy because society is in a constant state of flux. 
The former Minister of State for Labor and Employment, Mr. Festus Keamo, used his first day in office to defend the president's decision to assign him to the Ministry of Aviation. The president did not send me here by, by mistake. I think he has clear ideas as to why he sent me here. And I will need your, your maximum cooperation. Everything I do has always been, you know, um, with the aim of satisfying the people first. Former federal lawmaker Mr. John Enor reported for duty as a Minister of Sports. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Yusuf Tugger, also assumed duty at the ministry, where he unveiled his vision to rightly place Nigeria at the regional and global diplomatic pinnacle. Meanwhile, the Minister of State Petroleum Resources, Gas, Honorable Ekwe says gas to power, gas to industry and gas for export are priority areas that will be pursued aggressively. Today in Nigeria, because of dependence on the other sources of uh, power, we don't have regular power supply. But with gas, which is cheap and readily available, the reserve that we are having today will last us for so many hundreds of years. The minister, like his colleagues, thanked the president for the opportunity to serve in his capacity, but the country and her citizens will be looking to see how their service translate to a better life and a better economy. All right, welcome back. Yes, indeed, those two gentlemen join us this morning. Uh, Mr. Daniel Obwala, legal practitioner and also a spokesperson for the dissolved Tiku Okowa Presidential Campaign Council. And then you also have beside him Liu Aldu, a member of Media Strategy Subcommittee of the APC's Presidential Transition Council. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Thank, Thank you for having us. Well, the president's quote, men are now in place. Uh, so, yes, uh, now people wait I don't know if it's with bated breath to see uh, how they will they've hit the ground, but uh, whether or not they'll see them running. But I know the PDB has been speaking up about their impressions um, about this, the entire cabinet, the entire team, asking them to reduce it. I don't know if you share the same view. What do you think about now that they've been constituted? We've heard at least initial statements from some of them, which some think it's an indication of what to expect. What do you think of it? Well, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, someone like uh, Latifa Bemi, senior advocate, I was very impressed, not just by his selection, uh, also by his performance at the Senate, but most importantly, shortly after the inauguration, I think there's a side interview where he said his core objective in that office is to ensure that there is adherence to the rule of law. And that uh, he said rule of law simply means obey rules and regulation and that the vision of Mr. President should key into the rule of law, stellar. Because, for example, him being a lawyer, the creed of our law practice is that every legal practitioner has to promote the rule of law, first start the course of justice, and not to be engaged in any conduct that is unbecoming of a legal practitioner. That is striking. There are some of them also that from their you know, initial statement, you could tell that they have a clear idea of what they were going into. There are others... Maybe they have idea we don't know, but their first speech with Nigerian people is threatening fire and brimstone. And uh, to us, we felt that um, somebody who does that does not probably have a firm grasp of the role he's going to play or an idea of where he's going. And then sometimes, even if you do, uh, priority also matters. I mean, if you have too many shoes, you know which one comes first, which one comes second. And so uh, then again... Uh, I feel that Mr. President's choice is his, is his prerogative, you know, based on Section 5, to choose whoever he wants to choose as a, as a minister. The constitutional requirement is not a big deal in terms of, you know, whether you have certificate or whether you qualify to run for House of and all that. But the nation looks at uh, the other aspect of competence, which is character and fitness. Looking at the person's history, look at the person's trajectory, look at the person's capacity and see whether he's fit for the job. And when you escalate it further, somebody may be capacious, can be uh, competent. 
but the role he's assigned to, is it a role that perfectly fits into what he can, you know, bring? And I feel that the president missed it. I have about seven to eight, you know, people that I felt were put into places that had nothing to do with their, their capacity. So, for example, if you have a phone and the phone is a smartphone, you know what it can do. But if you bought the phone, but all you could do with the phone is, say, you know, make a call and send a text, you're underutilizing that. And this is what I feel that the president has had a case of a mismatch. In other words, you have a square peg in round holes. And so we, history has taught us that as effective as you are, you can only optimally function in that area you have a maximum advantage. If you are put into a place where you don't have an advantage, because focus creates blindness. If I'm looking at you, I'm not looking at my back. So if you, I'm taken to a place where my capacity cannot be utilized effectively, uh, the presumption there is that either I become a liability there or okay. I become redundant. All right, well, we'll take a look at that a little further. But, uh, Mr. Aldi, um having seen all of this, uh, perhaps you could also respond much later in, the, in addition to your response to this question. Are you cautiously optimistic or outrightly optimistic that, look, yes, this team is in place, they will deliver? I'm optimistic. You know, I, I have faith in the president. I have faith in the uh... And, and those he has chosen to, you know, um, implement his um, promises to the people. You know, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of um, responsibility on those that have been chosen, you know, and um, it's a privilege for each and every one of them. Because when we look at the um, history of um, record of people we've, ha we've had in public service, you know, like, like I said throughout the campaign, I, I maintain it, like there's no individual who has actually excelled so well in the private sector and has you know, moved into the public service and a leadership level, you know, in, in a steady growth, no repetition, you know, from Senate to governor, you know, party leadership, then now president. It, it takes a lot to be able to have grown that way. So that in itself deserves a lot of, you know, a lot of faith in him. So, um, yes, there are a lot of concerns here and there in terms of um, some of the options, but they think we are... Including good. within the party as well? Yes, sure, certainly. Oh, I even personally have of my own. But of which one? Minister for Youth? There isn't any at the moment. Uh, they, I'm, I'm sure that will come. That will come, you know. You have your own reservations. Yes, you know, but then it, it, it depends on where you're looking at it from. He has a vision, you know, you, we, as, as, as much as we understand what he's trying to do, you don't really know as much as he does. You know, um, like my brother did say about um, round, round peg in square hole. No, I don't think so. It's about irrespective of what you have. It's a simple phone or a smartphone or a gadget. You know, it's about your intent for the gadget. You know, you, you, can, you can have as sophisticated as whatever it is if your intention is... It's about how you want to apply it. But you know what they say, the road to hell is based with good intentions. It's not just on intentions. You have to... Actualize. That was, why I made, that, that was why I made reference to his track record. When we look at Who's the president, record? President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's track record, I mean, let's, let's go back to 99. You know, all of, most of the people we have in national leadership today at state level, at national level, like, they were practically unknown. The former vice president was um, a lecturer in the um, University of Lagos. But right now, a lot of people stand up and point at him as a worthy leader. Why? Because someone like President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, way back then, Took a chance in if him. I could just follow, but there are several people who also think, but, but wait a minute, these people who have been in power are still there at the moment. They thought that uh, if you're supposed to give people a fresh breath and allow for fresh ideas and that participation and enthusiasm on the part of the people, they would have done really well to ensure that you, know, you bring in fresh folks into that governance space so that you defeat that purpose of people perpetuating themselves in office. But there are fresh faces in there. You have a, a, a minister for digital economy. You know, it's, it's fresh. So what, the number of them are. You see, this is this is what I. So it we, doesn't matter if you're bringing from a governor. Um, no big deal. No. See, we have to understand that there's going to be a fair and a fine blend of experience and um, you know newness. You know, it's we 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 are not about to throw away everything, all of our history. You know, we we we, we look at our journey so far from where we were before independence till this day, then we look at, you know, what has happened in the last few years, in the last transformation that has happened in innovation in the last 30 years, then we look at, a, a, we should have a vision, a national vision of where we want to be. And to achieve that, we need a fine blend of our history and our newness. So it's, 
it's very important for us to not think that the fact that we want to move away from how we used to be means we should throw away everything that we used to be. No, no, no. no. The people have said he's on, he identifies new talents, fresh talent. They built on that, and everybody expected they were going to see it across board. So what's wrong with people thinking that, given what the party had published to the people? Exactly. This is his promises. You know, he has made promises, and he has, we have given him the mandate, and he has seen these people as people he knows he can you know, implement his plans with and achieve. I mean, I, I, like I told you earlier, you know, uh, I'm looking at um, the Minister for, for Digital Economy and um, certain position or perception of the, of, of the nation he's had in the past, you know, and I, I was like, wait a minute. But then again, you know, it, it, it shows how much of a leader the president is. Like, it doesn't matter where you have been. It's about... Let's give ourselves a collective chance to succeed and to do that. I mean, let's actually believe that we can do this. Do you that... think, I mean, you have pointed to the press, sorry to interrupt you, but do you think that the president's um, history, the fact that he has been through these different levels which you have described, have now become sort of a burden to him? Because when you look at the fact that he's appointed 48 ministers, it's the highest we've seen since 1999. It's um, going to increase too. Isn't that kind of high? Well... 48, 45 were confirmed, three uh, are still in abeyance. It's unclear what their fate will be. Uh, but this is what we've seen. Even at 45, it's the highest we've seen since 1999. Don't you think that that is a burden of sorts for a country that is in dire straits and is looking at uh, reviving the economy? Again, this is why um, track record is very important in public um, governance. I don't think 45 is even enough. I don't think 48 is enough. We have a population of over 200 million people. What do you think will we are, be enough? We are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are in crisis, you know, so to put You want 55? No, 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 no. I, I'm, like, let me, let me, I'm not putting any number to you, but let's remember that when he became the governor of Lagos State, mm -hmm. he felt that um, the need to take governance closer to the people demanded the, the creation of more local governments. A lot of people thought he was, he was taking it too far, but look at how Lagos has moved in 24 years and how every other state has moved in 24 years. I'm not talking about potential. I'm not talking about um, what it used to be before then. I'm talking about sheer growth between then and now. And, and This growth, you're only speaking about it in terms of revenue? Every standard. Lagos isn't the poorest state in Nigeria, is it? Standard of living in Lagos isn't the worst in Nigeria, is it? Then, in terms of burden, Lagos holds the burden of the entire nation. The population... The migration of people from other states into Lagos alone have put enormous pressure on, the, on, on everything that Lagos has built in the last 24 years. But they are still building and still growing. What it means is if we can take a bit of this pressure off Lagos by creating six other states in six geopolitical zones that, that sort of reduces you know, um, rural urban migration, sort of reduces people living the north, the east, the west to Lagos, it balances up the state. And to do this, you need more people, you need more hands, we need more processes. So, and, I mean, and somehow the balancing act of this 48, I mean, some people will say, oh, well, uh, you also had people appointed for the geopolitical zones. That was what we used to see before, and maybe it would make it 42 or thereabout. Uh, but this, we see that this redistribution of the extra ministerial slots, because when they're over 36 or even 37, it seems that we now have excess. But distributed between the southwest, some parts of the of the south-south, and uh, I think the, the northeast and northwest, but not the southeast. So do you think that he also still has a political problem on his hands? No, there isn't. Now, this is what it is. There's, there's, the, there's the constitutional requirement, like we mentioned, which um, he has satisfied by, by, by this. Then the... Like he rightly said, this is prerogative, you know, as a president, to pick from where or whom he thinks or he believes in will help him, you know, implement the promises, deliver on the promises he has made to the Nigerian people. Most importantly, as a party, you know, um, the APC has a responsibility to improve. We have had three national elections, and... We, we, we can see clearly that we haven't grown as much in the, in the southeast and the south-south. You know, that responsibility isn't on the governance. It's on the political party. So I do not think, I mean, the president will, you know, bog himself with any political um, challenges right now. No, it's all, we have enough challenges on our hand in terms of governance. 
in terms of expectation of people, in terms of where we need to be. I, I that is where I think his focus is on. I don't know. Moment. Just a moment. I, I think you, we might be focusing a bit, a little too much on you, but I want you to take a look at this headline. This is Daily Trust this morning. Uh, Tinubu's 48 ministers to gulp 8.6 billion in four years. That's what Daily Trust is reporting. And you say that you think that we don't even have enough ministers. Are you looking at the overheads that are, going, are coming along with, you know, so many more ministers? It's, 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 it's not so much about um, the input as we should focus on the output. If I have to put in 10 billion naira in this to ensure that um, the poorest man in Nigeria in the next four years has a better um, life, has um, a better hope, you know, his hope is renewed, like I have promised. So be it. I mean, we, we're so fixated on the amount we need, we put into, um, into solving our problem, instead of looking at mm. our expectation of the solution. You know, how do we ensure that whatever we put in, we get the desired result? Mm. Mr. Boala, do you agree with him on any of the points that he's raised with regards to the number of ministers that have been appointed? And also, um, I mean, because you already said that you see a few bright thoughts within the cabinet, but overall you're dissatisfied with ministers who seem to be threatening the people. With regards to the number of ministers, are you satisfied that, you know, we might even be needing more to get us out of where we are? No, I'm not. I, in fact, uh, I disagree with both his premise and his conclusion. You know, when he said uh, Nigeria is a population of 200 people, over. There are over 200 people yeah. there for the million people, there for the number is not uh, enough. America has a population of 300 plus. There are 15 ministers. 15 ministers and 9 SA, constituting 24, 24 cabinet members, a, the greatest economy on earth. The New York budget for fire service in 2003 was more than the budget of Nigeria. Yet, they had 15 ministers. They still have 15 ministers. So I, I disagree with the number uh, of ministers. I, I feel that when it comes to the number of ministers, he was more particular about politics than about governance. You know, certain decisions people take, you say, this decision is born out of politics. This decision is born out of pure intention like for governance. Like the number of ministers is purely politics. The number of governors in the cabinet, purely politics. Uh, the portfolios assigned to certain individuals, purely politics. I don't have an expectation of performance that is going to be beyond 15% uh, looking at these uh, cabinet members. And then again... Why is that? Because a lot, you have a cabinet that is full of people whose track record betrays what we're expecting out of them. A governor who did not do much in his state, when he had the resources of the state, he, bear, he, he literally controls the legislature you know, and the judiciary, because sometimes they influence outcomes in court. He couldn't do anything, and where he makes executive decisions, nobody questioned it. Now he's coming so does to Does it matter if the governor is a minister of state who is not uh, directly in charge? Yes. Okay, for example, if you look at defense, what the minister of state and the substantive minister are from the same geopolitical zone. It's a strategic goof on the, on the part of Asiwaji. How can you make two ministers of the same ministry, state and substantive, from the same geopolitical zone? That's point number one. But the second one is even more intriguing. These are people that have never had any history that relates to defense. And people kept wondering, does Asiwaju have a particular uh, uh, feelings towards retired army generals? Now, if you look at the peculiar nature of the insecurity we have in the country, I mean, you have to bring in experienced people, retired army generals. You remember Buhari retired quite a number because he was looking to appoint somebody. And these people, resources that the government spent in terms of their training experience in the field, off field, abroad, and everything, they are not going to be put to use because now you are appointing a governor. For example, Minister of State for, Gov uh, uh, for Defense. His approval rating was less than 15% throughout his four years as governor of Zamfara. In fact, he failed... Was there a poll to that regard? Pardon? Was there a poll to that yes, regard? Yes, it's a CSO. It's a CSO. I forgot the name. Ah! I forgot the name. It's a civil society organization that did that. They, you know, they took a sample of people in Zamfara. You know, and and if you look at it this way, quite frankly, he couldn't even manage the army officers because it was around that time he had a problem with the security forces that the Buhari had to issue an order if he sent any helicopter, uh, you know, shoot it down. He also failed with the bandits because he now said he was going to introduce non-kinetic approach. He failed woefully. He's going to be minister of defense. He will sit. And he will be confronted by these people whose experience transcends the 
realm of Nigeria to Africa subregion. This is a president who is also thinking about invading Niger. You have to bring in experienced people. So this is an example where you have former governors who are not going to impact uh, uh, positively. You also have a governor who comes into a ministry but comes with the mentality that is a governor. Federal capital is not a state. And secondly, there is a law, the 48 laws of power. You don't know, Shani, your master. In this Abuja, the captain, is Tinibu, whether that is a minister of state, the act of the National Assembly. Complained? <laughs> Has he complained? No, yes. no, no. The reason I'm saying is because I'm giving my take, but I know yeah. for a fact, and you can mark that from today, well, lie it a lie. If here is not taken, it might not last up to six months. I'll tell you why. Right. Some of the things he came on board and they started venting for it. What are the basic needs of the residents of the FCT? Healthcare. Hospitals you go to, even some of the so-called strong hospitals, they don't have facilities. The patients don't have value for money. Look at the schools. Huh. There All are right. so many things you could have come and said, this is your defined. Then in the course of doing that, you will say, I will go ahead and then implement some of the Abuja master plan. Do you know that right now, if you compare Abuja master plan with what is on ground, 62.7% of structures on the FCT are not in their master plan, including structures owned by federal government. We'll come to that uh, and continue the conversation when we return from this break in just a moment. So stay on with us. Mr. Bola, what do you think about the appointment of Mr. Kiyamo? Well, uh, Kiyamo has worked hard enough for the party to be given ministerial slot. But the Ashuaju was quoted to have said he was not going to appoint any minister that worked under uh, uh, Muhammadu Buhari. But strangely, at the last minute, Kiyamo was uh, appointed. Now, in terms of whether Kiyamo has the capacity to be a minister, I mean, he's, he will beat a lot of people in that list. But the portfolio where he's sent to, that is where you're going to have a problem. Kiyamo should have been sent to the Ministry of Labor because he claimed success during the period of uh, Buhari. So if you had sent him to Ministry of Labor, he will continue where they stop in the hope that they will succeed. And even if they don't, since he has this uh, aggressive posture, that place, that is what it is meant for. Now, understandably, the perception of others that uh, Blanong was sent to Ministry of Sport as a punishment for his non-performance in the campaign. Labour. as his punishment for, the camp, for his non-performance at the campaign as the DG. But in Kiru, why how can you send a gentle soul to a place where, even before the negotiation starts, the federal government has taken a posture that there will never be a resolution? Till they, either the court sack them or they finish, they will never have a good resolution with the Labour. Anatu, who comes from Katsina, you want to invade Niger, you should appoint her as humanitarian minister because humanitarian problem and poverty are in the north. Betty should have done better as minister for culture. She comes from a culturally rich state. They do this annual cultural program. Mm -hmm. If you see a, quite a number of them, you know, that kind of a misfit where you push this to this place. Okay, for example, Alake. Alake was sent, Alake's, Alake's case is like the British people send sailors to America in order to get out of Europe. And I can understand the way he was trying to encourage himself, that uh, his role is very strategic. The president trusted but him. But it is strategic, isn't it? Uh, no, 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 no. I think as, uh, he, was, he was sent to solid minerals to be sent out of Villa. The original plan was for Alake to serve as a minister for strategic communication, which is, his maxim, which is where he has his maximum advantage. Look at the period after uh, Tinubu was sworn in, that he was with Tinubu. He reduced to a large extent the extent of GAF from Tinibu. His closeness to Tinibu has been more beneficial in all the places they went to, in all the addresses Tinibu gave. But the problem is that the problem is that there would only be one chief of staff in the villa. So it's either he was not able to manage that role and still recognize the presence and authority of the chief of staff there that created the perceived you know, problem that now led to him being sent out uh, to, to be sent to, uh, to, to a solid minerals in order to be sent out of the villa. And since he left, look at the performance of the president as far as media is concerned. Very poor. So is, that, is that right? Pardon me. Is that the case, all of this that he's uh, spoken about? Um, 
The, 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 the it's like he never left the party. The, the, just details. <laughs> I mean, I, just before we came on there, I told him that um, it is pretty difficult for him to distance himself from this government because, um, oh. I mean, we were at the forefront of, of selling um, President Bola Tirubu at the primary, before the primary, and I think he did a very good job, and I know he'll be back into the fold very <laughs> soon. I mean, I just want to respond to a few things he's mentioned. He's, he's talked about, um, starting with the matter of Delia Alaki. Like he said, yes, it, it, solid mineral is very, very, very essential right now. If you look at the, the, the continent as it is, you look at where we are, where, we, where we're trying to be, if you look at the body language of our continental leaders, and um, all of these um, coups happening everywhere, it's some sort of revolt against um, you know, imperialism, some sort of um, you know, decision or desire to move away from neocolonialism. And one of, the, one of the strongest angles they have actually taken so much advantage of the, of the continent is um, through our resources, solid minerals. I mean, you, 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 you look at someone like Dele Alakia, you look at his ability to be able to, to deliver um, on, on, on whatever task he's given, his, his, his discipline, his, his loyalty, his um, closeness to the president over a period of time. So he does not need to be with the president to know what the president will do in certain situations. Information, he, he is very good there, yes, but we have other people who are very good there. I mean, why would you want to waste such um, I mean, a talent in an angle where you can easily replace when you can deploy him elsewhere? I talked about the FCT minister and the, and the body language. I, while we understand, you know, because of um, his membership of BDP and the new PDP and their struggle, I mean, I understand where that comes from. But then again, he talked about justice, talked about what um, the Attorney General has said. Our number one issue in Nigeria is discipline. And what Wiki has just simply said in his first press address is... Um, is going to enforce discipline in Abuja. For us, we have been in Abuja for as long as the 90s till date. We've seen, we know when Malab Nasir Verify was FCT minister, his reign with all the others, the only thing that has been different has been what? Ability to enforce discipline, which is the language he's come up with. And if, if he does that right, everything else comes on. They talked about defense and the army generals. We need to move away from the fact that the armies are not built for leadership. They are not. I mean, in terms of our security issues... How can you say that? Good. Now, this is, this is, this is where, where, where we've had issues over a period of having military rule our country at that level for a number of times. Leadership is at a different level. When we come to this national leadership, we have looked at our security. I can't say that enough. We have looked at our national security as purely military issues. They are not. Okay. They now, are not purely military issues. Just a moment. I, I think you need to differentiate between... Uh, civilian leadership and leadership. I mean, if you're talking about, uh, you know, a military person or a former military person acting within a civilian space or a democratic space, um, and you say, oh, their training is not exactly suited to that, even that will be very debatable. Now, let me, but let to me, say that the military let, is not built for let leadership, me quickly, let me quickly, you know, there will be very strong quickly, objections with that. I, I, I agree, I agree, but like you said, in, um, I mean, when, when we talk about leadership right now, of course, we are in civilian sensation. We, we, we're referring to civilian leadership. That's what we mean. We can't be talking about it in any other direction. No, you didn't differ. You didn't distinguish it. Okay, you, okay. You just that, said leadership. Okay, now that's clear. We are talking about civilian leadership right now. Now let me let me remind us that in the last um, administration, certain media houses um, made references to the former President Muhammad Buhari's style of leadership. That to the point that some media houses actually, re I mean, they resorted to addressing him as. His last title in the military is against actually addressing him as president. You know, I mean... Uh, so you're not, saying he, he too wasn't suited to leadership? No, no, I am saying that there is, in, in, in a civilian dispensation, there is a general, you know, um, there is a general, um, what's it called, openness of all to having people like us, you know, understand us, know our challenges, and know perhaps how to lead it. The area, the specific area he's talking about is defense. They are not the CEO of the country. The defense minister, one thing you know is, um, he talked about how they are from the same region. We have our NSA from the Northeast. The military is more disciplined than civilians in terms of leadership, any day, any time. But the biggest solution we've had in our security challenges has been, like in the Niger Delta, we're not mil militarized, were they? In the under, under, Delta. Under, under the former late President Yara Dua, then Jonathan, the Niger Delta, um, the approach that, that gives us relative peace in Niger Delta. It wasn't military, was it? 
The military are more organized. No, was it military? More discipline oriented. No, let's speak from experience. And they are more result oriented, defined. I am rules. not arguing in this. In fact, it's just that democracy provided us as the best option. But in terms of looking at the military structure and civilian structure, which one is the most efficient and effective? Oh. Forever. Or you will never and then you talk about military, for civilian, civilian dispensation. When Iraq, when the when Iraq was uh, when the when Saddam was killed, who was sent to Iraq to to to, to administer? In fact, all the places where Americans sent their armies to either to invade to correct situation, the military structures there are the ones that are giving the guidance and the support to civilians. Now, how, I'm, how, mind you, I'm not talking minute. about how are we in democracy and we are making reference to an invasion as if it was the right thing. But the president wants to invade Niger. He, he hasn't told you that. Oh. He's simply following a written, a laid down protocol of the ECOWAS. He hasn't told you he wants to invade Niger. <laughs> That's not his decision. Those are, those to are Nigeria. No, 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 I think no, no, you need no, to no, be no, abraced no. with what is no, going on. No, no, get it right. Those are protocols, laid down protocols that existed before his And what's the protocol? France and the NATO. Uh, influencing okay, the, I, the, I, the gentlemen, I think, gentlemen, I, 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 I think we're going away from the discussion. Let, the discussion let me, let me is about ministers and, and uh, you know whether you know an ex-military man should have been you know appointed to the ministerial we, slot. We, we have had military head of state. We've been in military gov military system of government for decades. That hasn't fixed our military, our, our security We challenges. had a retired military we, man in Obasanjo. The, the biggest success Whose administration had. has been adjudged as better than all civilian administration from 1999 till today, hands mm -hmm. down. The biggest... The retired I, I asked general. you a question that you, 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 you didn't answer. The biggest success we've had in terms of hostility in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta, came from non-militarized approach. Let's appreciate that. We can only try to we can only try to replicate a system that has worked. It's not we, we, the fact that we've gotten used to military or general does not mean it is a working solution. It hasn't worked. It doesn't mean that when the military are there, all that they do is implement military options. Even they oftentimes advocate non-kinetic options. Just like it doesn't mean that the fact that you have a civilian head does not mean that we can't have technical work group, we can't have implementation project team, we can't have a, a, a different group that can be manned by these generals where their experience, their knowledge can come to use. But basically, we are in democracy. We have leaders who are now going to give instruction to this military general who are going to bring to use their experience, their expertise, their knowledge to follow through and lay down democratic processes of resolving our problem. So the head has to be purely civilian. Let's understand that. He Let's, talked, about, second. He talked about the head. size of ministry that I quickly wanted to understand. You compare a democracy of over two centuries uh -huh. to that of 24 years. It is easy to, I mean, I, I, I told someone in the last eight years that um, the way President, former President Buhari, his personality and his person and what he did in eight years would have taken an, an, an established state that is already running well, like United States of America, to a higher ground than, he, than the success he achieved there. You know why? Because it, it, you require more hands to build a working system. But the moment the system started working, you can now start reducing these hands. Right now, it is easy to say you have 15 cabinet ministers in the United States of America, but they have the system that is built that can, that can survive itself. We know what former President Trump tried to do to their system. If they didn't have a system that is in place, what do you think would have happened? So we are building... We are not to, let's not compare ourselves with developed nations. We are building a system. Until that system is built to the satisfaction of majority of Nigerians, then we need as many hands as possible. We need as much inclusion as possible. We can't be asking for inclusion and be talking about trimming down the number of people involved. No, it doesn't work that way. So let me, let me, let me, let me then just react in one, one minute uh, to that. You see... A lot of us still have a misconception about the military. Each time we think of the military, we tend to think as if they are always in the bush with guns in their hands. They have colleges. The military, the, the soldiers, they, go to, they undergo training. If you see a military doctor, you'll be shocked. A military lawyer, a military accountant, everything you see in the civilian administration and the civilian world, the military, the, the military they have it. The only difference is that by their discipline, they hold guns and they wear uniform. Now, and then the, 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 the retired military generals I'm referring to are people who are no longer holding God. Now, if, if you say just because in their lifetime they have served as military, therefore they don't have the experience or knowledge of the civilians, that is where I have the quarrel. Because well, well, I am gentlemen, if you can uh, allow me to uh, butt in for a bit. Uh, gentlemen, just, just a moment. Um, as as Malpoy said, uh, we seem to be getting off track. You know, a lot uh, is expected uh, by Nigerians 
of these ministers, of this administration at that. So the question that I want to ask, and I think, uh, you know, Mr. Bola, you mentioned something along, along that line the other time. Uh, I think, you know, the question was around whether or not you were hopeful of any significant performance with this uh, you know, administration, given the, the ministers that we have. And you said you weren't, you weren't too expectant. Does that mean then that we are hopeless? I thought the job of the uh, opposition parties was to ensure that whatever government is in power, whichever ministers are in power, rightly or wrongly, as you have quoted, they take them on and make sure they call them to account. That is a job for the opposition to ensure that they perform, whether they want to perform or not. So in that regard, do you think we are hopeless? Well, uh, you know, uh, somebody told me, a governor, serving governor in APC, that since 1999, no opposition member has been more objective than I am in terms of uh, providing alternative. The essence of uh, opposition is provide alternative. So we don't criticize without providing alternative. For example, with respect to the cabinet appointment, I gave you my opinion. In terms of performance, now, they, they promise renewed hope. But what have we seen so far? Renewed hunger, renewed hardship, and somebody use a local pal and say renewed shege. Now, every, every of the promises, when the president took, from when he took the oath of office in today, he has made four major decisions. On all four grounds, he got it wrong. One, he said uh, the subsidy is gone. Now he has to walk back on that because evidently it is now proven that he didn't have a firm grip of what was the situation if you're saying what he said. Naira has never come back come down since what he said, and he has to now do a walk back. Two, does this, does this, does this mean, Mr. Bwala, just a Nigerian second, people just a second, if you can hear me, does this mean then that it's all woe and no glow in all of these conversations that we are having? Again, I go back to the function that the opposition is supposed to come back. You've told us so far uh, all the things that government has done that has been all right, fine. What is the alternative or what are the alternatives? And that is just the president. Now we have ministers in power who are supposed to take on several different sectors, quite a number of them of the 48 or 45 ministers that, have already, that are already in power. So in terms of expectations of Nigerians, they're not going to all cry woe, you know, woe all the time because it's our life as a people. So speaking patriotically, if you can, is there any way yeah. or what things you can you know, put your foot down and say, if these ministers don't do this, then we're going to go worse, worse and worse over the years. So uh, if you have a wrong mechanic to fix a car because the car has a problem and uh, you insist that the wrong mechanic is the one that will fix the car, and you know he does not have the experience, he does not know what he's doing, no matter how positive-minded you are, that in the course of this thing, the Holy Ghost is going to help him, Unless he knows the solution, he can never effect the change. Now, if I tell you that, what do you think I'm suggesting to you? Obviously, to change the mechanic. But they have just been appointed, so obviously nobody's going to change anybody. That's number one. Two, if you are driving to Lagos from Abuja, and you take the road that leads to Lagos, they say all roads does not lead to the market. How do they put it in Yoruba Palace? Now, if you are going to Meduguri, but you're on the Lagos path, unless you change your path, and reroute yourself to Meduguri, there is no amount of speaking in tongue that will automatically turn Lagos to Meduguri. That's the point I'm saying. There is a problem of capacity. There is a problem of clear-headed goal as to what you want to do. Now, Section 5 is clear. No minister there functions outside of the wishes and will of the president. It says that the power of the executive is conferred on him, and he performs it by himself through the vice or the ministers. He, and I like his attitude when he told them, that, look, I'm going to be held liable, so I want you to do what I want you to say. That is the right way. Because some people tend to think that if the president gets it wrong, that somehow, somehow the minister will automatically perform magic. Now, every minister in the government of the Federation is expected to carry out the vision of the president as regards the ministry towards the goal of the party. There are some who have been made ministers. They are not even members of APC. They don't even know the renewed hope. And so they, what, the way well, they are going well, already, Bola, from the way they've started, Mr. Bola, unless there is a retracing of the steps, 
Yeah, Mr. Paula, it's hard to There's fault. No way they will arrive at. It's hard to fault your argument, really. Uh, it sounds quite convincing, but then again, uh, I wonder if we can throw away the baby with the bathwater. Let me come to you, um, Mr. Aliu. Uh, still on the matter of cost of governance, uh, you have also argued to the effect that, not not quoting you copiously now, that we should look at the expected outcomes you know, rather than the size, and that the president reserves the prerogative to appoint the number of ministers that he uh, chooses to work with, you know, but I'd like you to help us differentiate between these or amongst these ministries. We have the Minister of Solid Minerals. We also have the Minister of Steel Development. Uh, there's uh, the social welfare component in the Ministry of Health. Uh, but we also have the Ministry of uh, Poverty. We have the Poverty Alleviation Nomenclature added to the Ministry of Humanitarian affairs. Uh, what, in your own view, is the justification for these um, dividing lines and what would have been similar or, 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 or one ministry functioning uh, as a whole? All right. Um, like like, like I, have, I have said before, we, we need to understand that, um, I mean, lumping all of these um, expectations in one house or in one room can um, only you know, reduce our abilities to achieve results in quick time. We don't have, you know, um, forever to turn this country around. And it, as, as many hands as we can have on, 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 on deck, you know, the better for us, especially if they are effective. Uh, and we know they are going to be effective because we have someone who is in charge who has taken responsibility. For every time he has taken responsibility in the past, he's proven himself right and he's given us results. Now... Um, those ministries being broken into, into um, more ministries just shows that scientifically, you know, the, the larger the surface area, you know, the, the, the higher your, 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 your state or rate of reaction. You know, that's, 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 that's that. Steel and solid mineral being separated shows that we, are, we, are, we have an entire ministry that is going to pay attention on steel. You know, we, there's the automobile industry, there are a whole lot of indoor, a whole lot of things coming up that are built on that should be built on steel. They should, I mean, we have a Jakuta that we all believe is rotting away. We all believe we will not be able to move, you know, as much as quickly as we can, or we should move if you know such, you know, um, such a place isn't put into proper use. We, we know what rail has done for us in the last few years. It's not effective because. Somewhere like Ajakuta is ineffective. Take care of that and we where we are. We have just discovered lithium. And that, what that shows is, is another reminder from Mother Earth that, you know, Nigeria is a special project. You know, it's, it's, we, there, there is no country that has been as naturally blessed and as humanly blessed as Nigerians, as Nigeria. And for that reason, you know, we need to bring a lot more people to, go, to, to work and to, to do this. We need to create you know, different areas where people can be working together. We, have, we need to have more people working at the same. I don't even think we have enough people working as it is right now. If we know what we have to do, we, we, we have how many population, how many millions of our people, of our citizens are living in, in abject poverty. If we need to take care of this in quick time, it means we need more hands to work. And he, I mean, I, I hope that answers it in a way. Let, I quickly wanted to say something about the subsidy he talked about. I don't think... No, anybody's talking about bringing back subsidy. But yes, the president is looking at, you know, the cost of energizing the productivity of our, of our nation, the production sector of our economy. The energy is the ability to do work. And we have seen how expensive energy is. We are now in realistic touch, in reality. We are now in, in, in real, you know, um, experience of what energy actually costs, like it is glo globally. So what other way can the government come in? Can we look at the energy rebate scheme? where we sort of rebate that. Government is, is exploring that angle. It doesn't necessarily mean it is subsidy. It doesn't have to be subsidy. Well, Mr. Mr. Liu, you know, uh, I mean, uh, well, there were professionals in, in the ministry, uh, the, the, the ministry under review in the last administration still, particularly in the steel uh, ministry. Uh, well, Ajakuta still, you know, did not come up and run in. Still, uh, still on the um, matter of reducing cost of governance, you know, some groups have come out to say that the former governors who are now ministers should, um, you know, 
uh, stop receiving life pensions. Uh, what role would you think the president should play in this regard, particularly as a former governor as well? Should he be leading the charge, you know, to call on the state government uh, to stop his life pension? That's if he's uh, not receiving it at the moment, such that, you know, the other uh, ministers who are former governors can also follow suit. Oh, yes. I think, uh, I mean, it's a right call, and I, and I, and I, and I think um, everyone should support that, I mean, including the Mr. President. I, I, I know the former governor who is now in the Senate, I, I think it's from the southeast or somewhere, I, 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 south, no, southwest, yes, uh, Ogun State. I mean, I, I read somewhere, yes, who had written to the state government asking for his... You see, we need to, we need to ensure honor. And we need our, our leadership class, we need the leaders to, to show, you know, um, as much as we want Nigerians to make sacrifices, the leaders should take the lead in that. They have to make sacrifices. You know, the idea of, uh, it is no longer, you know, the, the intra or inter battles. No. We need to look at ourselves in the eyes and tell ourselves that this country has to work. We need to succeed, irrespective of what side of the, of the, of the pitch you play, irrespective of what side you belong. We need to. I mean, opposition can be more collaborative. Opposition can be more. Can be. Can. can, can they, sh they, they should do better. I mean, uh, my brother did, did say that someone told him that um, he has been the best opposition. The person lied to you. The best opposition <laughs> I have seen since 1999 is, is the current president. You know, when he was in opposition, he was so effective that he is a president today. That the is that. Led. That is a. That is, that is a t no, that is a testament. That is a testament of how successful he has been in opposition because he has been able to change the system, bring in a, 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 a government that he believes in, and he has been able to, you know, there is nothing else about taking responsibility than doing it yourself. Can I react to him? So, I mean, I'm, I, it wasn't supposed to be anything, but I'm telling you that what we need oppositions to do is not to do opposition the way it used to be done. It is 2023. You need to be more... You know, innovative, you need to be more sensitive, you need to be more patriotic, you need to look for ways. If it's not enough to just come Mr. and Aldo, criticize, give me an alternative plan. Mr. Aldo, you, you, you seem to be digressing here to the opposition. I'm asking you to make a call on Mr. President himself to lead by example, by asking Lagos State to stop his life pension. Know, no, no, no. That's if he's still receiving it. Oh, yes. Mr. Aldo, can you oh, hear me? He has I, I, like, I, like, I like the condition if he is still receiving it. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. Nobody should disagree with that. No one should disagree with that. Like I said, there's a lot of call for the ordinary Nigerian to make sacrifices. This would be unjust if the leadership is not making sacrifices, if the leadership is not making enough sacrifices. But I do not think this... Sacrifice has to be has to do with the cost of governance. No, let's let's not go let's not go getting. Um, I, I'm I'm looking for the right word now. Getting this thrifty idea of being very um, you know we 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 don't have to want to be you know penny wise and pound foolish. You know let's. It's not about ten billion to run government. If you are going to run a government with ten billion that ensures that the the poorest man, the most vulnerable Nigerian, is taken care of in the shortest period of time, so be it. That's the goal. The goal isn't the amount you spend. The goal is the expectation of the government, which is the welfare and the security of the, of the, of the people of this country. Let's, let's focus on that and not focus of, on, on... The process it takes to get there is important, yes, but our attention shouldn't be about what it costs us to run a government. It should be about what we achieve with the government, how many people, how many Nigerians have we okay. been able to renew their hope? Quick response before we go. Yes, for example, uh, our, our attention should not be about what it costs us to run a government how can you do a business without knowing the cost of running the governance business? Governance is not business. Let's get it right. It's Go not business. Governance it's not profit is business. and loss. Governance, governance is not profit and loss. The profit is the improvement of the welfare of the people it's of service Nigeria. To, it's service to humanity. In, in which, service. which service are they giving to humanity? But let me just, so that, because of time. Now, secondly, in terms of opposition and what role they are playing, uh, we, we, we told the president when he said subsidy is gone without providing the palliative before. We criticized it, provided the alternative. He did a walk back. That's opposition. He said he was going to invade Niger within seven days. We told him no, and we provided the dangers that, you he know, are waiting. And, and, and then the president walked back. Now, he, he said he was going to give 8,000 8, to the Nigerian people. We told him no, it will not work. And then he had a walk back. 
Now he's giving bribe of five, to five billion to every state. And we're telling him that will not work because even Labour ran the numbers and came to a conclusion that 1,500 is going to be per aid. What will that do? We say, no. We told them the alternative is provide infrastructure that will create jobs, that will better the life of the people rather than bribing the governors because there's going to be a runoff from the election. Yeah, but I, let me quickly say something about when we talk about... Um, yeah, but I mean, what we know is uh, Grant Mr. Daniel Long. Wala is a very he honorable... He has talked more than I have. Who... He, he is a very honorable man. All right, gentlemen. We expect to use certain words for, for, for the sake of... We want a country that works, so we need word? to be very cautious of what the kind of words. When you say he has bribed the, the governors, I mean, you can't What's defend that. Bribe? You, you can't... De it's, of course, it's illegal. Everybody well, it's actually knows grants, it's illegal. They call it Grant and Loan. And so, it, and it is so meant, which one do they stand on? Grant... And the loan. Well, which part is the there grant? Is part, which part is the loan? We'll You're thank, giving a governor loan. We'll the part is of what did they do on. with it? Uh, Mr. Daniel Bwala and Ali Aldi, thank you both for coming on. We're back thank in just you. a moment, everyone. Stay on with us. So Honorable Tessa Ugbo joins us. He is the Chairman Ad Hoc Committee on Students, Loan and Access to Higher Education. He's also Deputy Committee Chair for on Environment. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Yeah, good morning. Well, listen to that. I mean, one needs to ask, is there an issue, is there a challenge with this law, this act now? Well, yeah, there are, there are improvements that need to be made to the, to the act that was signed into law by the President when he assumed office. And as soon as he signed that law, um, there was public outcry um, from stakeholders in the sector regarding a lot of the requirements and the bottlenecks that were obviously observable in the Act. Uh, so as the National Assembly, we took the responsibility to provide leadership to amending the Act and uh, providing some framework on how um, the student loans program should work in Nigeria. And that is what we've been trying to do over the last few weeks since the ad hoc committee was set up. I see some places where you say that schools should not increase school fees, uh, but uh, well, some of them argue, well, unity school fees has been increased from forty-five to 100000 so that's in principle. They wonder, what's wrong if it applies in tertiary institutions? Uh, well, it, it, it seems obvious that school fees will probably go up in tertiary institutions in Nigeria. Tertiary education has been subsidized for, for so many years in Nigeria. Just the way we've subsidized petroleum, we've subsidized power, we've subsidized you know, just almost everything uh, was subsidized since the 70s. Um, and so universities have been run by allocations from, from the federal government. Yeah. But it's, it's about time that universities start finding some autonomy um, so they can operate independently, they can source for other sources of funding. And then, of course, uh, as a business, um, the students are the customers to the schools. And so um, the students, too, the school fees they pay, um, as proposed by the federal government through the student loan scheme, is also a funding um, a mechanism for universities to, to make sure that the quality of education they're providing for the student is, is matching with the, with the cost of that education, which is what the student loan scheme is trying to balance out. Mm. I'm quite excited about the fact that the House of Reps is, you know, taking a very uh, strong look, <coughs> excuse me, at the implementation of the student loan. Uh, I think tomorrow you're holding a, is it a conference oh, or on it? Summit, yeah. summit, yeah. What's that? A summit, a legislative summit. Legislative also. summit. And what do you hope to achieve with that? Yeah. Well, the, the, whole, the whole idea is to bring together stakeholders in the sector and policymakers to share ideas and propose amendments to the current Student Loans Act. Um, for example, when the president, in the, in the last national broadcast by the president, he, he announced that he was waiving all uh, requirements or hindrances to accessing the student loans by students. So it means that every student who wants to uh, get a student loan for education should be allowed to apply and access student loans. But to implement that, you have to amend the Act, because the Act puts a lot of restrictions on who can assess, how you can assess these loans, the requirements, um, you know, guarantors from lawyers and things like that. You know, so all those encumbrances, all the requirements, we need to wave them aside and find other mechanisms through which we can make, uh, it, you know, make it easier for students to assess these loans and, of course, make it easy for them to pay 
um, back these loans after after graduation. Well, the requirements were such that a lot of students were, you know, up in arms and saying that, look, uh, with the kind of criteria that has been listed here, it means that nobody will be able to access the loans. Uh, first and foremost, even talk about minimum wage. And even those on a minimum wage, who, who maybe both parents are on a minimum wage uh, cycle, will not, automatically not, count, you know, qualify for the loan because at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at their salaries per annum, they fall out of the people, you know, whose children will qualify for this. So... What are some of the parameters that you're looking at now? And will it also cover students in private universities? Or is it just strictly for students who are looking to government-owned universities? Well, the, the act as it is, uh, is only focused on targeted to public universities. Universities, polytechnics, uh, colleges of education, as long as it's a higher institution. Um, we anticipate that the private universities will have something to say about this. Um, it happened with the TED Fund. You know, when the TED Fund was established, it was focused on public institutions, but eventually they opened to private institutions. So, and we think that for this student loan scheme, <coughs> private institutions should be probably allowed to participate. Um, the, the feeling is that if you can afford private education for your child, then you don't need a student loan. But that is not really the reality. But a lot of parents have been forced to move their kids to, student, to, to private universities because of the inefficiency in the public school strikes and all that. A lot of parents are, have taken out loans of their own to fund their children in private universities just to avoid the strikes and the, 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 the uncertainty that has bedeviled our public education system over the years. So it is not a given that because a child is in a private school, then you know, that means the parents are going to afford um, to pay um, for, 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 for private education. You, know. um, you mentioned the, the, the issue of the minimum wage for parents. You know. The limit was 500,000 naira. So if your family combined income is above 500,000 naira, that means you cannot participate, which means if your father is a security man somewhere and he earns uh, 50,000 naira um, per month, that means he's, he's earning something like 600,000 monthly, so his kids can't participate. So if he has four kids um, in university because he earns 50,000 naira a month, then his children can't participate in student loans, which is obviously is very unrealistic. So these are some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, and we hope to eliminate some of those kind of bottlenecks that uh, are just not realistic um, for us. Well, a number of people is to keep the loan revolving. Uh, you know, this is not the first time that the federal government has come up with laudable schemes to try and see how people can get loans. Uh, but the payback is always an issue. And uh, how optimistic are you that given this culture we've, we've experienced over time, well, I don't say culture, maybe I should say our experience over time <laughs> with all things loans, um, even banks, deposit money banks, usually have quite a bit of challenge getting their money back. And we were saying how the Amcon has had to come and write off loans for a number of banks. Um, how optimistic are you that this is something that we can make uh, differently this time around and, you know, have it a truly revolving, uh, you know, student loan door? Well, um, from, from our studies, uh, you know, of student loan schemes across the world, um, there's, there's no student loan scheme that can actually survive be purely based on a, a revolving fund. You know, uh, it always, it's, it's an intervention kind of thing. So the government will always have to budget some money for, for students' loans uh, in the country because you will always suspect um, defaults. The most important thing is to reduce the default rates as much as possible to put in place mechanisms that uh, guarantee that students are able to pay um, these loans after school and are able to find jobs um, to pay the loans. So... We don't anticipate that in the next six to ten years, when maybe the first batch of student loans repayments will start, um, Nigeria will still be in a situation where the average student graduates and, can, and cannot find a job. We're hoping that things will improve and more jobs will be created for students on, upon graduation. But most importantly, it is the duration of how we're trying to structure this loan. So, for example, if you took a loan of uh, one million naira to fund your, your education for four years, um, and after four years, you're, you're given one year um, for NYC another year to, to stabilize and find a job. So after six or seven years, then you start paying the loan. And you have 10 to 20 years um, to pay this loan. So it comes down to something like 10,000 to 20,000 naira monthly um, for repayment over a, a very long stretch of time. Um, and we expect, we anticipate with that um, 10,000 monthly or 20,000 naira monthly as repayment shouldn't be too much for an average student to pay once you, you, know, once you come out of school and you find something, something doing. Um, Nigeria currently has the database systems, like the BVN, the NIN, and all that that can track uh, revenue and uh, income of, of every citizen in the country through the bank accounts. So I'm sure government will be able to put a tab on, on um, defaulters. 
not to criminalize default because we know the challenges in finding jobs and um, how it could be difficult in several circumstances. But, um, it's just to make it as easy as possible to encourage uh, citizens um, to pay up. And of course, there will be checks and balances uh, over time. But if you don't pay your student loans, then you have a, a credit, a debt in your, in your credit rating. Oh, okay, Honourable, you if you other, can hear me, uh, Honourable, so it, it it's interesting that you, to to uh, if you put it that way, back, um, uh, Honourable, can you hear me? Yeah, so, I mean, it's yeah, interesting that you, you, you put it that way. I mean, I take a phrase from what you just said now, your response to Malquest's question, find jobs. And my question goes straight to the quality of education for which uh, you are loaning people, uh, students, money. Does the job of your uh, committee remotely or directly uh, touch on the quality of education for which you have, uh, quality of education that you are funding? Because it is one thing for them to uh, get these loans and go to school. It's another thing entirely for that loan to be able to give them the kind of education that will make them employable. A former minister of labor, I think, at some point said that we have unemployable graduates in Nigeria. I don't know if the quality of education, the curriculum have changed since that time. So is your job in any way, remotely or directly, anything to do with the quality of education, the curriculum uh, that the students have to study with? I think the, the student loan program is, uh, it creates a win-win situation for, for both the students, the institutions of higher learning across the country, and the, and, and the country in general. Um, and why do I say this? Um, we as, I expect that if uh, uh, students begin to pay school fees uh, 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 representative of the quality of education that they are expected to receive um, upon paying this kind of school fees, then the institutions have a responsibility to employ better teachers, improve their quality of, 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 of teaching, um, improve the skills of, of their teachers themselves, and of course, generally improve the learning environment uh, across public institutions in Nigeria. Um, it is something that we expect as uh, part of the ripple effect that will happen as a result of this student loan scheme. It's also a way of funding universities. It's like an indirect way of funding universities. So instead of just uh, allocating uh, uh, funds to universities every month, every year, as we currently have, this time around, you're, you're offering these funds to universities through, through student loans. So the schools have a responsibility to the students to make sure that they provide better quality education um, for the students in Nigeria. And we, we as, as a committee, it's an adult committee, to come up with a framework on how best these student loan schemes can be I'm, implemented. I'm glad you also but mentioned, we know that once yeah. we finish our job yeah. and we, you know, we, we hand over to the committee itself, then they will take over in ensuring that the implementation and the quality of education that is provided is also improved through, through this funding that will be provided. I'm, I'm glad you also talked about the, um, the schools themselves, the institutions of higher learning in all of this conversation. Is there a monitoring system to ensure that, you know, the schools deliver uh, as much as the students are paying for? Because now it is the students that are going to be paying for their education by themselves, going by what we're saying about the student loan thing. So. Is there a way to also ensure that the students get value for their money from the school system, i.e. Uh, infrastructure, as you mentioned, learning facilities, and a staving off of strikes? Yeah, one of the, the challenges we've had over the years in Nigeria, you know, is the issue of strike. And why, has, why have strikes happened? obviously as a result of poor funding of education, and this has led to a drop in the quality of education we've had in the country for, for many, many years. We've not invested enough in education. We've not made the targets um, set up by the United Nations and other international experts on, on, the, on, the, on the quantity of funding that should go into education as a ratio of our national budget. Nigeria actually ranks as one of the lowest in Africa in funding uh, tertiary education as a, as a percentage or a ratio of our GDP and budget. So we need to improve and increase this, this figure. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we as a committee uh, proposed maybe an increase to the 1% that is proposed in the Act. The Act currently proposes that 1% of all, all national revenue from, F, from the FRS, from customs, immigrations, the oil sector, um, is, is put aside for student loans funds. But we, we realize that this might not be constitutionally very possible because of the the issues with the states um, and sharing of, 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 the, of the revenue that comes in. 
And so, if the federal government is going to fund this scheme through its own share of the, of, of the federal allocation, then obviously um, an increase in this, in this 1% will have to be uh, effected to make sure that there's enough funding um, for the student loan schemes and also, of course, invariably more funding for universities to improve their facilities and infrastructure. Um, the Federal Ministry of Education uh, has said a lot in terms of the efforts they've made to, to improve public education in Nigeria. We all know the decay uh, in public education, not just uh, at the tertiary institutional level, from basic education all the way up to tertiary uh, education. Um, but through this scheme uh, and through the funding that is being proposed um, for financing this scheme and, of, of course, indirectly financing the universities, we expect that universities will take the mantle now to improve their the quality of the education, improve the salaries of, of lecturers in this country, um, and ultimately um, improve the, the, the quality uh, of education, the curriculums, in, that our indeed. students are, are graduating from school better educated, yeah. Indeed, uh, Honourable Tezia, uh, the student loan would be an indirect way of funding the universities, but it's also, uh, th that's just part of the funding aspect required by universities, considering the overall overhead that universities require to function. But earlier on, you were talking about mechanisms that will be put in place to ensure that, you know, students are not criminalized uh, post the repayment plan. Uh, this is important, Honourable Tezia, because of the, you know, um, high level of unemployment in the country. Uh, and I believe that the act uh, sorts of provided minimum, uh, a minimal uh, prison term for those who are unable to pay back. What mechanisms ha ha will be put in place to ensure that, you know, repayment plan will be fail safe, will uh, enable the uh, loan applicants payback? Well, like I said earlier, um... No, no student loan scheme in the world is 100% foolproof in terms of uh, recovery of, of student loans. Because we, we know that, number one, there will be, there will be, there will be debts um, of students, there will be dropouts, there will be abscondments, there will be a lot of uh, tricks um, that many students who can even afford to pay, but we decide, that, you know, we decide not to pay, as, as we've had in the past with other loan schemes in the country. We have this perception that um, government funding is free money, so we don't have a, a duty to repay this, this kind of funds. But I think because we now have um, systems in place like the BVN, we have systems in place that we could put as checks and balances. For example, if you're owing a student, if you, if, if you got funding to go to school and you graduated um, 20 years ago, you've been working and you have not paid um, your student loans, um, you may want to contest an election one day. You may want to get a federal appointment one day. You may want to even travel abroad one day. And when it is... Uh, uh, found out that you have student loans that you've not paid for for several, several years, and it's obvious that you've earned a lot of income over the last 10 to 20 years after graduation, then, then maybe there could be some penalties for that kind of default. But the idea of the student loan scheme is not to criminalize non-payment of loans because we know the challenges that have to do with employment in Nigeria and uh, poverty and other aspects of, of our national development. So um, the most important thing is to create a system that makes it easy uh, for students to repay these loans over a long period of time, put in place uh, insurance uh, programs in place, put in place even, even grants and, uh, and waivers that could also come in um, to sometimes support or, or clear up some of these, these grants. Um, the average Nigerian, graduate, average Nigerian student will be looking for either a government job or white-collar job. We're also in, insisting that Every private organization or government agency that is employing a graduate, one of the criteria um, to check is to check if the student has, a, if the student owes student loans. And if you do, then it is put as part of um, your deductions or your income as soon as you're getting this job. So, the, so the, the amount of students who go into government jobs and who get white collar jobs in, in the organized private sector, it will be much easier to track their incomes and, and, and make sure that these loans are repaid. But, but for those students mean... who will end up in the informal sector, who end up in private businesses, probably this is where we're going to have to be looking at, you know, tracking their, their incomes um, over time and encouraging them and putting in place mechanisms that makes it easy um, for them to pay these loans just to reduce um, the default as much as possible. But does that but mean course, that the... Um, like I said earlier, too... Do, does that mean, yeah, sorry, Honourable Teze, does that mean that the two-year repayment plan uh, required will be reviewed just to take into cognizance those that may not immediately get a government job or even a private sector job? Well, the, 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 the idea is to give 
um, as much time as possible for, for repayment. So if you're studying a four-year course, after four years, you have one year for NYC and one extra year to settle down um, and look for a job. So that, so that makes it six years. If you're studying a five-year course, then you have one year extra to, for NYC and one year for, for you know, free to look for a job and, and you know, go forth. And so we expect that. The repayment plan starts after you finish this moratorium period of schooling, NYC, and the extra year. And then you have uh, maybe 10 years to 20 years to repay these loans. And from our analysis, um, in every scenario that we've tried to, to recreate the possibilities and the payment plan for students, we don't anticipate that any student will be made to pay more than 20, 25, or 30,000 naira monthly after graduation, depending on how much you borrowed, depending on the, the kind of job you're doing, depending on the kind of skills you acquired um, while schooling. We also anticipate that the student loans will also encourage more students to read professional courses. So rather than the general um, you know, social sciences that we're really used to in Nigeria, with student loans, students who probably would have preferred to read medicine, preferred to read engineering, architecture, professional courses that are better employable in Nigeria will be encouraged under the student loan scheme so that we can have more sciences and more technology-based courses that are more relevant for our modern, uh, you know, for the modern economy and the globalized economy. The, the, so time, more jobs. the time frame which you have uh, slated for this is not taking into cognizance any strikes that could happen. Hmm. And so you're actually hoping that a four-year course to be a four-year course. Uh, but we've seen situations whereby, you know, students, I mean, beg your pardon, lecturers have been on strike for close to, you know, for more than a year, I mean, more than half a year. So uh, how do you account for that? Or how do you think that this moratorium period will also account for those periods where there might be uh, in an industrial action by the lecturers? Well, um, if, if there's a, a national emergency in the country where the entire country comes to a halt and there's no activity, then we'll have to, we'll have to amend and shift as, as we move along. But we anticipate that through the student loans funding, universities get this funding directly. Um, issue of strike should be a thing of the past in Nigeria. Once the government hands off from funding of education directly and makes it more of a private sector um, kind of thing and makes it a relationship between the students and the, the, the schools themselves. So if it's, as a student, you're paying one or two million naira to study medicine or study architecture as against paying 200,000 for the entire four-year course right now, then we expect the schools to also act more responsibly in the interest of the students and, and as much as possible look for other means to address the, 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 the issues, the grievances that have always been, uh, that have always led to these strikes that we've had in the country over the years. After so all, we just hope that Nigeria will come up with a better um, plan, you know, to Yeah, to we, we, we need to. Challenges. After all, our parents tell us those days, uh, we went to scholarship from scratch up until we finished. So there'll be nothing wrong with to make sure this uh, equally happens moving forward. Well, thank you for coming on, Honorable Tessa Ugbo, Chairman, Ad Hoc Committee on Students, Loan and Access to Higher Education. He's also Deputy Chairman, House Committee on Environment. All right, we do have some messages uh, from you out there. This is uh, a tweet from Dr. Igbamwasa, who uh, himself, uh, right here and right now, is talking about uh, what he describes as the student loan, he says, the approach to funding education in Nigeria is commendable. However, this must be matched with improved quality of education and learning environment. And uh, first, Sakimoyewa says, student loans should not be means tested. Every tertiary institution student should be eligible for the loan and it should be paid directly to the school, period. This one is from Dixon Aker. It's an email. It says, I congratulate the newly sworn in ministers of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I urge them to settle down quickly and start the needed job to help the president deliver on his mandate. There's more, but uh, I guess we must manage our time. Well, we most certainly have to. Thank you so much for the privilege of being a part of your morning. We saw your mail as well. Uh, Harry, I want to know. Thank you so much for it. Also talking about the president's uh, leadership. Well, that's the much of uh, your, com your uh, feedback and the program we can take for this morning. Thank you for the privilege of your morning. I'm Ayo Makine. Have a wonderful day. Yes, indeed. Thank you for allowing us to share your morning. I am Bukola Koka. Thank you. I'm Maokwe Yusuf. And I am Chamberlain Osok. Goodbye.